Students running for their lives as another school in America becomes a crime scene. This time in St. Louis, two dead, several injured, the shooter taken out in a gunfight. The triple-demic threat, health officials sounding the alarm about three respiratory viruses now affecting children. RSV, the flu, and COVID as hospital beds fill up. What parents need to know. On the front lines, a rare interview with the commander in charge of Ukraine's ground forces. So how worried should the world be about Putin's tough talk, the threat of nuclear conflict, and what will it take for the war to end? Rising anti-Semitism, the shocking demonstration of hate in Los Angeles as anti-Semitic incidents hit an all-time high. Neo-Nazis siding with the rapper formerly known as Kanye West, now yay, many more Americans outraged at his words. The ABC News exclusive, a Uvalde school staffer falsely accused by law enforcement of propping open the door, speaking out in an exclusive interview with ABC News. As new video shows what really happened, the trauma she says she still faces. I will never be that person that I was before. I did die that day. Caught on camera, the warning from police in Florida after a man tried to lure a girl into a van near her school, even offering her candy. Tonight, the child's mother speaking out. And uphill climb. She is one of the most recognizable names in sports journalism, winning praise and pushback for her comments. Jamel Hill talks about her new memoir, her departure from ESPN, and her new mission. At one point, when I was a sports columnist, I was the only black female sports columnist at a daily newspaper in North America. The business can't look that way. Good evening. I'm Mona Kosar Abdi in for Lindsay Davis. Thanks for streaming with us. We begin tonight with yet another shooting inside an American school, this time in St. Louis. Aerial footage shows those nerve wracking scenes that we've seen all too often. Students fleeing from the city's Central Visual and Performing Arts High School shortly after 9 a.m. this morning amid reports of a shooter armed with a long gun. Inside, another student taking cover under a desk, live streaming as an alarm sounded in the classroom and police responded. And the heartbreaking scene outside as authorities confirmed that two people were dead, a teenage girl and an adult woman. Several others were taken to the hospital with injuries. The gunman was killed during a shootout with officers. His possible motive remains under investigation tonight. ABC's Alex Perez leads us off from St. Louis. Tonight, the all too familiar images in this country terrify children running for their lives during another deadly school shooting. The report of an active shooter in a high school. The calls for help coming just after 9 a.m. at the Central Visual and Performing Arts High School in St. Louis. <whistles> One student live streaming from inside a classroom. Just as police arrived, okay, everybody line up in a single fire line, okay? And guided them to safety. I seen my friend have all blood on her hand, and it was like she seen the shooter, and they, the shooter came to her and said, You ready to die? Worried parents racing to the school. When we got here, I just started hearing shots, and they just made us get down, and they told us to get away from the scene. So she was communicating with me inside. And let me know that everything is okay. Police say the suspect was armed with a long gun and killed one adult woman and a teenage girl before police killed him on the third floor. Police insist the school doors were locked, but they did not reveal how the suspect got inside. The security staff did an outstanding job identifying the suspect's uh, efforts to enter and immediately notified other staff. Students checking on each other and reuniting with parents at a nearby parking lot. Our children shouldn't have to experience this. The FBI and ATF now assisting with the investigation. Alex Perez joins us now from St. Louis. Alex, what more can you tell us about the suspect and this investigation? Well, Mona, authorities have now identified the gunman as 19-year-old Orlando Harris. They say he graduated from this school last year and lived with his parents. An exact motive remains under investigation, but authorities say they are looking into reports that he may have suffered some, from some sort of mental illness recently. Mona? Alex Perez, thank you.
A health warning for parents. There is a so-called triple-demic striking children. The reality right now is COVID. The flu and RSV are circulating at the same time and sending children to the hospital. Officials in at least 43 states and Washington, D.C. report to ABC News that they are seeing an increase in hospitalizations for pediatric respiratory illness. Doctors say there are safe and effective vaccines for two of the three viruses causing harm right now. Here's ABC's Ariel Reshef. With winter looming, tonight health officials are warning of a triple threat, a so-called triple-demic from flu, COVID, and the virus RSV. As people pull back, no longer wear masks, congregate together, then you get a surge of infections that might have been spread out over a period of time. And respiratory viruses are roaring back with a vengeance, leaving hospitals increasingly strained. 75% of the country's 40,000 pediatric beds are now full. Texas Children's in Houston has more than 40 patients with RSV, at least 10 in the ICU. I would look for breathing fast, breathing hard. If your child is using the extra muscles to help them breathe or they're not eating and drinking well and not making good wet diapers. Two-month-old Adrian Balka was struggling to breathe with RSV when his parents rushed him to the ER. He had to be transferred to Texas Children's where he was put on a ventilator. But tonight, Adrian is making progress. It comes as flu cases are expected to soar, the number of hospitalized flu patients climbing from around 1,300 to more than 1,600 in just a week. And Ariel joins us now. Ariel, with this so-called triple threat, how are doctors trying to get the word out to parents about vaccinations? Well, Mona, doctors stress that there are vaccines for two of these viruses, the flu and COVID, of course, and they say it is safe for children to get both at the same time. The best prevention and way to keep your family safe. Mona. Ariel Rashev, thank you. Now to the war in Ukraine. Russia is warning that Ukraine is planning to detonate a dirty bomb, a weapon laced with radioactive material. But Western officials insist that that simply isn't true. And tonight we have an exclusive interview with Ukraine's top military commander on whether they're winning and what the end of the war could look like. Here's ABC's chief foreign correspondent, Ian Panel. Tonight, the U.S. and allies rejecting Russia's claim that Ukraine's preparing to use a dirty bomb and blame Moscow for it. The West calling the Kremlin accusation transparently false, backed by no evidence whatsoever. The concern is that Russia's planning a false flag operation, blaming Ukraine while carrying out an attack using a conventional explosive laced with radioactive material as its losses mount on the battlefield. But today, the White House also saying they've seen no signs the Russians are planning to detonate such a device imminently. We are monitoring as best we can. I can also say that, you know, we've just seen uh, no indication of of preparations uh, at this point. The Kremlin looks increasingly desperate as Ukrainian forces advance, especially towards the strategic city of Kherson. General Alexander Sierski is the commander of Ukrainian ground forces. How are you? He sat down with us for an exclusive interview. How worried are you? How worried should all of us be about Putin's nuclear threats? I must agree with you that we are and should be worried. And I do believe that such a threat really exists. And we have to take it into account. Sirsky gave Russia its first major defeat, defending the capital at the start of the war, forcing Putin's men to retreat. He's now leading the major counteroffensive here in Kharkiv region, already liberating thousands of square miles of territory. We create the conditions under which we can make the enemy lose confidence, get nervous, start taking losses and abandon their positions. General Sierski graduated from the oldest Russian military school in the 1980s. Studying Soviet battlefield tactics, he says Russia's still using today. A rather basic question, but I think an important question, Are you winning this war? Of course I think we are winning, because first and foremost, we are winning mentally and we have success on the front line. We understand that this war is about survival of our people and our state, and this is why we have no other option but to win. For now, Putin is losing the land war, but he's responded with mass mobilization at home and mass strikes in Ukraine targeting the country's power plants, leaving civilians in the cold and dark with winter rapidly approaching. General Sersky, how do you end this war? 
How do you achieve peace? You know how we say here in Ukraine, we long for peace, but after our victory. Those are quite simple words, but have profound meaning. Give me your vision of, of how this physically ends, what that looks like. It's when Ukrainian flags will fly all over our borders, including Crimea. Ian Panel joins us now from Kharkiv in eastern Ukraine. Tonight, the Biden administration, the State Department, made it clear if a so-called dirty bomb is used by the Russians, it would be another example of Putin's brutality. Ian, has the State Department signaled that there would be any consequences? Yeah, Mona, I think what they're trying to lay out very clearly is that they've made it clear to the Russians, both publicly and privately, that there will be, quote, severe consequences for any kind of nuclear use. And obviously, that potentially includes the use of a dirty bomb as well. However, and this is important, the administration is saying that it hasn't seen any obvious signs of preparation for any kind of nuclear detonation as of now. Mona? Ian Panel in Ukraine, thank you. We are 15 days away from the crucial midterm elections here in the United States. Tonight, we go to Nevada to check in on the race for Senate. The only Latina in the Senate, Catherine Cortez Masto, is defending her seat. Her opponent is Republican Adam Laxalt, who led the effort in Nevada to overturn the 2020 election. President Biden has been largely off the campaign trail, but spoke to Democrats behind closed doors today. Here's our Rachel Scott. President Biden today acknowledging Democrats face an uphill battle in the midterms when historically the party in power loses seats in Congress. So far we're running against the tide and we're beating the tide. Nowhere are Democrats facing that tide more than right here in Nevada, where the nation's first Latina senator is fighting for political survival. There's so much at stake, we all know that. Catherine Cortez Masto, now in her first term, battling low name recognition in a state that's seen a large number of voters move in and out. Tourism, the backbone of the economy, ground to a halt during the pandemic. Inflation now above the national average. Gas prices, the fifth highest in the country. Who is right there with Joe Biden every step of the way? Senator Catherine Cortez Masto. The Republican candidate, former state attorney general Adam Laxalt, tying Cortez Masto to the president and the economy. Senator, would you campaign with President Biden? He is always welcome in Nevada, but as you can see, my focus is on getting out and talking to Nevadans. Cortez Masto repeatedly linking her rival to Donald Trump. Thank you, Mr. President. In 2020, Laxalt helped lead Trump's failed effort to challenge the election results here. They're running around peddling conspiracies and lies about an election that they claim was stolen that wasn't. The Laxalt name is well known in Nevada. His grandfather, Paul, was a senator. But this year, in an extraordinary move, 14 members of his family have endorsed Catherine Cortez Masto. Rachel Scott joins us from Nevada. Rachel, there are only two weeks to go. Where does this race stand? Well, Mona, I could tell you that this is a dead heat. It's one of the closest races in the country. 538 shows an even split between the Democratic Senator Catherine Cortez Masto and the Republican Adam Laxalt. But the important thing to note here is that if Republicans are able to win in this state, their chances of flipping the Senate go from 45 percent to nearly 70 percent, Mona. Rachel Scott, thank you. Shifting gears to the rise in anti-Semitic hate and the investigation in Los Angeles after several people hung anti-Semitic signs from a bridge over the freeway, some even going as far as giving a Nazi salute. One sign saying Kanye is right. ABC's chief national correspondent Matt Gutman is in Los Angeles tonight. Tonight, those banners over one of L.A.'s busiest freeways drawing nationwide condemnation and concern. The banner reads, Kanye is right about the Jews, unfurled by white supremacists seen given the Nazi salute. The hip-hop artist Kanye West, known as Ye, has given a series of bizarre interviews in recent weeks peddling anti-Semitic conspiracy theories. And he topped those rants with this tweet, saying he was going on Death Con 3 on Jewish people. He literally has leapt to the front of the line as probably the most visible and the most vicious anti-Semite in America today, and maybe even in public life in general. It's stunning, it's shocking. And critics are saying it's catching on. The night after those banners, leaflets blaming Jews for COVID appearing around Los Angeles, including Beverly Hills. As a daughter of the survivor of the death camp, Auschwitz, I just felt like I literally couldn't breathe. Mm. 
and our community was in a state of shock. Anti-Semitic incidents reaching an all-time high in 2021, more than 2,700 cases of assault, harassment, and vandalism, up 34 percent from 2020. Yeh's anti-Semitic rhetoric causing the French fashion house Balenciaga, the talent agency CAA, and J.P. Morgan all to sever connections. And last week, the hip-hop artist seemingly taunting Adidas, which sells his pricey Yeezy line on the Drinks Champs podcast, saying, I could say anti-Semitic things and Adidas can't drop me. Matt Gutman joins us now. Matt, Adidas is a big partner of Ye, and they do sell his Yeezy sneakers. Have they said anything about his comments? And Mona, they're still selling those Yeezy sneakers. Now, back on October 6th, uh, Adidas said that its relationship with Kanye West was under review. But we've contacted them since then. Many other organizations have done the same. Not a word. They have not weighed in since then. Now, the ADL is calling that silence both deafening and dangerous. Mona. Matt Gutman, thank you. For more on this show of hate, I'm joined by Elizabeth Newman, former assistant secretary for the Department of Homeland Security and ABC News contributor. Elizabeth, how shocking is it to see banners flown from a freeway overpass in a major American city spreading these kind of messages of hate? It really is heartbreaking to see, and yet not surprising. We have been in the middle of an uptick in the anti-Semitic activity. Uh, we saw the Goyam Defense League doing stickering, uh, which is similar to the activities we, we were reporting on. Um, and they've been doing that quite frequently for the last few years, so this is just their latest effort. But certainly what Kanye is doing is uh, bringing amplification to it that uh, is, is rather disgusting and likely will result in violence. We just don't know where or when. And speaking of that uptick, the Anti-Defamation League reported anti-Semitic incidents reached an all-time high in the U.S. last year, a 34 percent increase year over year. What do you think is driving this increase? You know, it's hard um, to pinpoint. It is one of the oldest forms of hatred, one of the oldest forms of violent extremism. We often th think back to World War II, but it goes far, far back. Um, a lot of the conspiracy theories that we have been seeing on these leaflets, I mean, they are hundreds of years old. Um, some of the Bible verses that were printed on the, the sign over, over um, uh, the freeway in L.A., those have been used um, in, inaccurately uh, by, by people for anti-Semitic conspiracy theories for, for hundreds of years. Um, so it's, it's hard to pinpoint why right now, other than we are in a six-year uptick of domestic violent extremism in this country. So every form of conspiracy theory often ties back to Jews, unfortunately. And so anytime you see that increase in white supremacy, increase in other types of hate, you usually also see a rise in anti-Semitism. And Elizabeth, one of the signs hanging over the 405 freeway that we just cannot ignore said Kanye is right. The rapper formerly known as Kanye West has been stoking anti-Semitic ideas in interviews. What responsibility do you think that he has in a case like this? You know, look, this situation is tough. I, I don't know the specifics of, of his um, particular challenges. It, it, there is suggestions that perhaps he's not mentally well. Um, but setting that aside, anytime you have a prominent figure like that, uh, you're, you're um, bringing attention and awareness to things that usually are on the fringe. Usually you kind of push aside. He is giving it air and empowering these domestic violent extremist groups. We've been watching online chatter of people um, that are a part of these white nationalists, white supremacist groups, anti-Semitic groups, looking at what he is doing and viewing it as an opportunity. And so the concern I have, besides the fact that it's disgusting and intimidating and, and um, we just don't want it in our society, the, the broader concern is that usually these upticks then lead some very small percentage to go do something violent. And it's just very hard to predict when and where that might occur. Um, so we really need uh, voices of calm to, to condemn uh, this rhetoric and say that is not who we are as a people um, and that uh, it will not stand. And, and you are seeing a number of political leaders say, you know, come out and condemn this, but it would be great for Adidas to deplatform him and everybody as much as possible to deplatform uh, this, this anti Semitic rant, rant that he seems to be on so that it doesn't um, possibly incite somebody to violence.
It is undeniable that Ye holds a large platform. And you mentioned it. Several companies have already moved to cut ties with Ye, including his talent agency, CAA. But the German-based sneaker company, Adidas, has not. They say they are reviewing their relationship. The ADL called the silence, quote, deafening and dangerous. Would you agree? Absolutely. Anytime you're platforming somebody with that level of prominence and, and giving airtime to his rants, um, it, it in, invites uh, people who are both disaffected and mentally unwell, as well as people who are just bigots, people who, who have hatred in their heart. Um, and, and the thing about the violent uptake that we have been seeing over the last six years is that as more of this kind of hateful rhetoric is in the mainstream. Um, a lot of political leaders have been using hate-filled rhetoric and us, them, context and the way that they view policy and ideology. The, the more that you have that in the mainstream, the more permission it gives to individuals to think that they should do something. And sometimes that something is violence and it leads to death. Elizabeth Newman, thank you for your time. Thank you. Next to that severe weather threat tonight and the first widespread snowstorm of the season in the West, the heaviest snowfall came in Montana up to 22 inches. ABC senior meteorologist Rob Marciano is tracking it all for us. Rob, hey, how are you doing? Hi, Mona. I'm doing well. That main piece of energy that brought all that snow in the Rockies now dropped into the southern plains, and that's spawning some severe weather that really we're just starting to see. Check it out on the radar. Watch boxes up for central Texas. A rough line just went through Abilene. You see the swirl behind that. That's that upper energy. And the rain ahead of it, that's mostly gentle rain. They'll take it. They could use the rain there. But this line will likely hold together over the Dallas area tonight. And then the, some of this energy lifts up into, say, St. Louis and also taps the Gulf of Mexico for moisture. So another the line kind of reinvigorates itself once it gets through the Mississippi River. And by 5 o'clock tomorrow afternoon, you're at Nashville is into it. But the main threat for seeing damaging storms will be from Memphis down to Jackson in through Birmingham. It can't rule out a tornado or two as well. So a big chunk of the south and southeast and the southern plains will be uh, pretty dicey weather-wise here over the next 36 hours. Mona? Uh, all right, Rob Marciano, thank you. When we come back, video shows a girl running after someone allegedly tried to kidnap her. What police say happened right before she got away. An uphill journey through her life and work as a sports journalist. Jamel Hill tells us about her new memoir chronicling her rise in sports journalism and the aftermath of a tweet that grabbed the attention of the Trump White House. But up next, she was falsely accused of leaving a door open, allowing the Uvalde school shooter to get in. Now, with new video backing up her claims of innocence, the Robb Elementary School staffer describes a lingering emotional fallout from those allegations. This is ABC News Live. The crushing the families trunk. here in Poland. At refugee centers in Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. Here at the White House. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. We made it. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Bring them on. If only there was a place in the morning to start my day. With a smile, somewhere to help me get in the know. A place as spectacular as, well, me. Hmm, I think we might know a place, right, guys? Bring your friends. Oh, wait, there is. Good morning, America. GMA, 7A, every day. Boom. 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 Good morning, Michael. Good morning, Robin. Good morning, America. How are you? Boom. Now that's how you start your day, people. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? <laughs> Let's go. How are you? Can I hug you? Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 12 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. With so much at stake in our world right now, we wanted to thank you for your trust and for making ABC News America's number one news. And thank you for making ABC News Live America's number one streaming news. With 
so much at stake, so much on the line. More Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir. America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. As of today, in a big way, we have inaugurated ABCNews.com. A lot has changed in our world since Peter made that announcement. But what hasn't changed is the commitment to groundbreaking reporting and innovation at ABCNews.com. And here's to everything ahead. America is being poisoned with fentanyl, and we don't even know it. Just heard my wife screaming. She told me they had just died. 50 to 100 times more potent than morphine. Keep breathing, come on. It's poison, it's pure poison. A few grains of salt worth of fentanyl will kill you. Just my agency has seized enough to kill the entire country. ABC News Live presents Poisoned, America's Fentanyl Crisis, the powerful series, streaming free on ABC News Live. With so much at stake in our world right now, we wanted to thank you for your trust, and for making ABC News America's number one news. And thank you for making ABC News Live America's number one streaming news. Just three days after the mass shooting in Uvalde, Texas, top police officials told the world a school staffer had left open the door the gunman used to enter Robb Elementary. That statement was retracted a few days later, but today, for the first time, we are hearing from that staffer and seeing exclusive new, newly obtained video that backs up her story. It's all part of Uvalde 365, a continuing ABC News series reported from Uvalde and focused on the Texas community and how it forges on in the shadow of tragedy. Here's our John Quinones with the emotional interview. It was just days after a gunman killed 21 in a Uvalde elementary school that Texas police said this. We know from video evidence, 1127, the exterior door where we knew the shooter entered was propped open by a teacher. But that woman, a school staffer, Emilia Amy Marin, speaking for the first time, says those words from law enforcement vilified her to her own community. He said, a teacher left the door propped open. And I looked at my daughter and I said, that's a lie. Did you hear anything about what they were saying about you? I did. People think she needs to be fired for what she did, leaving the door open. But I know what I did. Just a few days later, the Texas Department of Public Safety retracted the statement, admitting that Marine had closed the door, but that it didn't lock automatically like it was supposed to. Now, video footage from the school, newly obtained by ABC News and still not released to the public, shows that Marine, in fact, did what she was supposed to do when she spotted the gunman crash the car and approach school grounds with a rifle. We asked her to start from the beginning. Can you tell me what you're doing there? I'm rolling the cart out because I'm going to go meet my coworker outside. I'm running in to get my phone. Because? Because the crash happened already. And you're calling 911 yes. to get help? Mm-hmm. My first thought was somebody had a heart attack because he was coming like 80 miles an hour. And then he hit the rail and then crashed into the ditch. You're I'm running to him to help him. Little do you know, he has a gun. Yes. Marine kicks the rock away that was holding the door open. You see me kick the rock and, and pull the door. The door shut. You did not leave it open? No. As I'm running back, I tell her, he's got a gun, he's shooting. What could possibly have been going on through your mind? Panic. All the kids that were there on campus. I'm telling her to, t to please hurry. The kids were playing outside in the playground over uh -huh. here, and I see them running and s screaming. You wish you could take that day back for all the children and the teachers? To have them all back. Yeah. What do you think of when you see that video? I was scared, but... but I knew what I had to do. to get them in uh, to their rooms to be safe. Come on, guys, for me, come on! And they're coming in and I'm yelling at them, get in your rooms, get in your rooms. 
Shouldn't investigators have seen that video, watched that video, studied that video before accusing you of leaving the door open? Why didn't they? That's their job. That is their job to investigate. Today, Marin says the shooting and its aftermath have traumatized her. Her body shakes, she speaks with a stutter, and she suffers from anxiety and depression. I am suffering mentally, of course, emotionally. I still don't sleep. I see those victims' faces. I pray for them every night. What do you want to tell the director of the DPS today? McCraw. To Mr. McCraw. It is your job to investigate when any incident happens like that. You chose not to watch the whole video. You chose to blame me because you saw me put a rock on that door. You would think that they know their job well. He has no idea what his words did to me. I will never be that person that I was before. I did die that day. I see the windows boarded up and the fence around the campus. I tell my counselor, I'm in there. I'm s still in there. Still. I died that day. It's not right for me to smile or laugh. It's not fair. You think they're intentionally trying to make you the scapegoat? Yes. Yes. That's exactly what they were trying to do. Is there any way they can make up for that? No, sir. A powerful interview. Our thanks to John Quinones for that. And still ahead here on Prime, a guilty plea from a Michigan teen accused in a school shooting who he says he brought, bought the gun from. What a federal court ruling means for those applying for President Biden's student loan forgiveness plan. A championship matchup between the Houston Astros and Philadelphia Phillies. We look at their very different roads to the World Series by the numbers. But first, our tweet of the day from Kim Kardashian after days of silence responding to the yay firestorm. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? How cute. Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 12 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families the here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. Here at the White House. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Okay. We made it. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. America is being poisoned with fentanyl, and we don't even know it. Just heard my wife screaming. She told me they had just died. 50 to 100 times more potent than morphine. Keep breathing, come on. It's poison, it's pure poison. A few grains of salt worth of fentanyl will kill you. Just my agency has seized enough to kill the entire country. ABC News Live presents Poisoned, America's Fentanyl Crisis, the powerful series, streaming free on ABC News Live. Bring them on. If only there was a place in the morning to start my day. With a smile, somewhere to help me get in the know. 
A place as spectacular as, well, me. Hmm, I think we might know a place, right, guys? Bring your friends. Oh, wait, there is. Good morning, America. GMA, 7A, every day. Boom. 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 Good morning, Michael. Good morning, Robin. Good morning, America. How are you? Boom. Now that's how you start your day, people. Ready for election night. I'm ready for debate night. I'm ready for it all. This midterms is really important. Hi, everyone. We're going to run you ragged. What would George do? You're working on it, George. We're going to make you proud. As of today, in a big way, we have inaugurated ABCNews.com. A lot has changed in our world since Peter made that announcement. But what hasn't changed is the commitment to groundbreaking reporting and innovation at ABCNews.com. And here's to everything ahead. Welcome back. The matchup in this year's Baseball World Series is now set, and the two teams facing off took very different roads to get to the Fall Classic. Let's take a look by the numbers. Major League Baseball's 118th World Series will feature the Houston Astros and the Philadelphia Phillies. The Astros led the American League with 106 wins and have zero losses so far in the playoffs. It is the fourth World Series appearance for Houston in the last six years. While members of the Astros have won the title, this would be the first World Series for their incredibly accomplished manager, Dusty Baker. The Phillies, meantime, finished the year with 87 wins and eked into the playoffs as the last wild card team. Their Cinderella run in the World Series has been a team effort, but their $330 million man, Bryce Harper, has loomed large. Harper is hitting 419 in the playoffs and delivered one of the most clutch hits in baseball history last night to send his team to the next round. With the Phillies down 3 to 2 in the bottom of the eighth inning, Harper smacked a two run home run to put the team ahead. It was a blast for the history books. Only five other players in the past six. 62 years have delivered a clutch home run with their team losing to put their team ahead in a series clinching game. The Phillies last won the World Series in 2008 and last night's win set off Bedlam in Philadelphia with fans dancing on their own through the streets of the city of brotherly love well into the night. The World Series begins Friday night in Houston and we still have a ton to get to here on Prime. For some, it is more terrifying than a horror movie, while your collection of candy may seem smaller this year. And remembering a comedian, actor, and social media sensation, what we're learning about comedian Leslie Jordan's tragic death. But first, a look at our top trending stories on abcnews.com. So much at stake in our world right now. We wanted to thank you for your trust and for making ABC News America's number one news. And thank you for making ABC News Live America's number one streaming news. Now streaming on ABC News Live 2020. True crime, cinematic, real life drama, stunning, the unthinkable. Follow the clues, the hunt, true crime 2020. Now streaming on ABC News Live. One year later, the breaking new event special, streaming free on ABC News Live, America's number one streaming news, and stream on Hulu. Admit it, these days, what you need to know seems to change just about every day. What is it that you really want to know, need to know? To help you not just get through your day, but to make the most of it. Feel smarter. Feel better. Feel happier. Well, how about a third hour of Good Morning America? GMA3, what you need to know. Now streaming on ABC News Live. It's all about you. I know what happened, and I'm not guilty. Why the fascination with criminal trials? Figure out what's really out there. She revealed she had murdered his family. I know in my heart that he did this. It's the time of suspicion. The ending's really tough. You don't know whether truth is going to be difficult to find unless you try to find it. America's number one news, ABC News. Most watched, most trusted, 
and streaming live to you anytime, anywhere, and free. This is ABC News Live, America's number one streaming news, free to you 24-7. Watch America's number one news whenever you want it, wherever you are, anytime. ABC News Live, streaming live and free on all platforms. It's time. Get it, your friends. Lucky, I guess. <gasps> 31 nights of Halloween. Watch all October on Free 4. Gunfire at a high school in St. Louis. At least three people, including the suspect, are dead. Children went running out of Central Visual and Performing Arts High School away from the gunfire. As officers arrived, they say they were told where the shooter was inside. Staff directed police were to go. Interim Police Commissioner Michael Sachs says a shooter got into a gun battle with officers and was shot and killed. Police say they don't know yet why the school was targeted. While on paper we might have nine victims, eight were transported and one remained. We have hundreds of others. Everyone who survived here is going to take home trauma. Police have identified the shooter as Orlando Harris, a 19-year-old former student at the school who graduated last year. Officials are still working to determine a motive for the shooting. There's suspicions that there may be some mental illness that he was experiencing. Uh, we're working on developing that information right now. One by one, 24 charges read aloud by a Michigan judge. Accused school shooter Ethan Crumbly pleading guilty to all of them. The 16-year-old suspect admitting to killing four of his fellow students in Oxford, Michigan last year and injuring seven others. Among the charges, four counts of first-degree murder and terrorism causing death. The teenager now facing life in prison. Crumbly was also asked to confirm that his father bought him the gun he used in the shooting. Is it true that you gave him your own money to buy the fire? Yes. And that the weapon was kept in an unlocked safe. Yes, it was not locked. The state charging his parents, arguing they ignored a lot of red flags. The White House will respond to a temporary injunction to block the student debt forgiveness program. Six Republican-led states are challenging this. They argue that the president overstepped his authority here, but the White House is vowing to fight this, and they're encouraging people to still apply. The press secretary saying they are going full speed ahead because they are still able to review applications right now. The president's plan would cancel up to $10,000 in student loan debt for individuals making less than $125,000 a year, or as much as $20,000 for eligible borrowers who were also recipients of Pell Grants. A new assessment on student school performance shows the early days of the pandemic might have contributed to record lows in reading and math scores. According to the National Assessment of Educational Progress, declines were seen among high and lower performing students in fourth and eighth grade in both math and reading. Math scores for eighth grade fell by eight points from 282 in 2019 to 274 this year, and the sharpest decline recorded in more than half a century of testing. Now, Education Secretary McGill Cardona told reporters that the report is an urgent call to action. The report says the results show the importance of in-person learning. Emmy Award actor Leslie Jordan, who played a number of roles on the big and small screens, has died in a car crash. Jordan was best known for roles including Will and Grace, for which she won an Outstanding Guest Actor Emmy, an American Horror Story. The veteran actor also gained popularity during COVID-19 lockdowns, posting daily comedic videos of himself to social media. Jordan was 67 years old. This Halloween, there may be more tricks than treats, thanks to inflation's impact on the rising prices of candy. According to the latest Consumer Price Index report, the cost of candy and chewing gum is up about 13% from this time last year. And as those prices soar, the packaging is shrinking, known as shrinkflation. Hershey's confirming a bag of their dark chocolate kisses is now a couple ounces smaller than it used to be. And that two pack of Reese's cups, a tenth of an ounce lighter, Hershey's telling ABC News the changes were consumer-driven improvements. Now to an alleged kidnapping attempt police say was caught on surveillance video. Police say a 10-year-old girl in Florida was approached not once but twice, two days in a row by the same man. Authorities are now trying to find that man seen in the video. ABC's Eva Pilgrim has the very latest. An urgent search. 
Police in Fort Lauderdale looking for this man who they say tried to lure a 10 year old girl into his van on two separate occasions as she made her way to school. Offers her various things to try to bribe her into getting into his vehicle. This new surveillance video police say showing the little girl as she ran away. The girl's mother, who didn't show her face on camera, spoke out about the terrifying ordeal. We're still in total shock. I just keep thinking, what if, like, if he had gotten a chance to really um, get her in that van? Police say the girl told them a man in a black van first approached her Wednesday on her way to school, offering her candy. He opened the sliding door of his van and showed her the candies and told her to get inside and take a look at all the candies um, that he had. Authorities saying she managed to get away, but then the next morning, that same man allegedly approaching her again, this time on foot. He said, hey, you forgot your candies yesterday. So she got frightened, she ran, she um, seek help, and then the police, they contacted me. This surveillance video from that morning from a nearby school showing the girl sprinting down the street, pausing for a brief moment, then running away. On the right side of the video, you can see a man wearing all black heading in the direction of the young girl before turning back and walking away. Words can't describe how um, proud we feel to have her as a daughter. She did the right thing. We're happy with that. She's here with us today. Police passing out this flyer in the area, searching for the man they say could be involved. Neighbors now on alert. As for the young girl, safety experts say she did exactly the right thing in that moment. She ran away from this person. Uh, she's done everything her, in her power or that she knows to stay away from this person. Every parent should have this discussion with their child. As unlikely as an event like this is to happen, we've got to be careful and we've got to protect our children. And our thanks to Eva Pilgrim for that report. Back overseas to that historic news from London tonight, where Rashi Sunak is set to be the next prime minister. He'll be the third one in seven weeks and the first non-white and non-Christian person in that role. Sunak previously served as the country's finance minister, and he's promised to take a different approach on the economy than his predecessor, whose moves wreaked havoc on the financial system. ABC's foreign correspondent James Longman has the latest from London. Tonight, the UK set to have its third Prime Minister in just seven weeks. Rishi Sunak is therefore elected as leader of the Conservative Party. Yeah. Rishi Sunak beating out his fellow Conservatives, including former Prime Minister Boris Johnson, who could not rally the party behind him. There is no doubt we face a profound economic challenge. We now need stability and unity. The new Prime Minister faces enormous challenges, uniting his party and saving Britain from recession. It was Sunak who warned his predecessor, Liz Truss, that her plan for major tax cuts at a time of record inflation would cause economic chaos. We, Liz, we have to be honest. We have, we have to be honest. But borrowing your way out of inflation isn't a plan, it's a fairy tale. The son of immigrants of Indian descent will make British history as the first Prime Minister of colour and the first Hindu, and at 42, the youngest in 200 years. He'll also be the wealthiest. His wife's father is an Indian tech entrepreneur worth billions. The markets responded positively today when this former Treasury Secretary became leader, but Sunak and his wife are worth around $830 million. That's about double King Charles's personal wealth. So as many here struggle to pay their bills, there are big questions about how easily they'll be able to relate. Mona. James Longman, thank you. And return to the midterm elections. Just two weeks away, Arizona is one of the hottest political battlegrounds this fall, in part because of the rapidly changing demographics in the state and a wave of new voters. Recently naturalized American citizens is expected to play a critical role in key races. ABC's Devin Dwyer met with some of those voters to learn more about the impact that they may have. <laughs> and you even got the sticker. Yes, look at the sticker. The sti How do you feel? I feel excited. Yesenia Cruz Bejarano just cast her first vote as a U.S. citizen. I've been here for so long, you know, more than half of my life, so I feel so proud. The mother of three from Mexico who works at a children's shelter in Phoenix says a lot is at stake in the midterms. Did you feel the pressure I, of this election I on your shoulders? I feel not the pressure, but I feel excited, happy that I can make a difference. You're smiling, you're, all, you're giggling. Yeah, I think, you know, I am very happy to be able to vote. Eduardo Sainz got his first general election ballot by mail 
but he came in person to deliver it, a moment 16 years in the making. I feel like I'm making that difference, not only by my vote, but also encouraging all of my family members, neighbors to go out and, and participate in elections. In Arizona, the newest American voters could be some of the most influential this fall. They've come to this country to be part of the American dream. They've come here to be part of the fabric of our country. A racially and ethnically diverse mix of immigrants from all over the world. I'm from South Sudan. Tuak Ruon, a father of five, and Tima Patrick, father of six, became U.S. citizens earlier this year as refugees from North and Central Africa. Why U.S.? Because my country is firing war. We have a diversity of new people that are changing the electorate of Arizona. Political scientist Yurisema Coronado says the state's red Republican politics are becoming purple. How does that change the way that candidates have to campaign? A lot of people care about many different things, and so you have to make sure that you are reaching the audience. One of the most politically important states, Arizona, is home to nearly half a million naturalized citizens. That's more than 6% of the state's total population. Nearly a fifth of them joined the voter rolls since 2016. Most of Arizona's naturalized citizens live here in the Phoenix metro area. More than half came from Latin America, a third from Asia, two groups of new citizens that historically have high rates of voter participation. This is a powerful, rising uh, voting block of people who are most likely bilingual, multicultural. We heard concerns about the southern border. For me, the most important issue will be immigration. Worries about the economy and access to medical insurance. Number one, um, the health care. And concerns about Arizona's strict new ban on abortion. There's been a lot of women that have the same concerns that I do, and a lot of them are now getting much more invested in the politics. Arizona's newest voters are disproportionately young and female. More than half are under the age of 45, and nearly 6 in 10 are women. It's not a homogeneous group of voters. They're not all Democrats. They're, oh, no, absolutely not. As advocates for newly minted American citizens step up outreach here to help them fulfill their dreams. You know, there's so many people becoming American citizens. You know, I have, I have a lot of friends, you know, they're they doing it right now. I think it's, it's a big, it's going to be a big impact and a big yeah. difference. And our thanks to Devin for that report. Jamel Hill is one of the most recognizable names in sports journalism. She opens up about her life in her new book, Uphill, a memoir, which chronicles her career rise while also reflecting on her public dispute with former President Donald Trump and its immediate fallout. Now joining us now is Jamel Hill. Thank you so much for being here. We appreciate it. Thank you for having me. All right. So the first question I have to ask is why now? Why did you decide that this was the perfect time to release this memoir? I've got this dream of being a fiction writer. I didn't want to write about myself. Maybe part of it is thinking about the things you have to unpack and the discomfort and the vulnerability. Like those were all very scary things to me. And so um, the market decided. My, my literary agent was just like, hey, listen, this is the story that the publishers want to hear. And so I said, OK, I'll just buckle down, bear with it and just go for it. And you definitely go there. You talk about your final days at ESPN, which is owned by your parent company, Disney. You Correct. talk about your childhood, the early days. You also talk about your career and the early days in your career. Um, why did you decide that all those experiences, or how did you choose which experiences to share? So even though I know to some degree, because of my time at ESPN, as you mentioned, which is under the ABC umbrella, like a, a lot of people know me from that. I was there at ESPN for 12 years. It's the best job that I've, I've ever had. And while our parting was awkward, I would say, there was so much of my life that I, there were so many experiences in my life that happened way before I got to ESPN. So I thought it was just important that people get a fuller picture of who I am and not just the lady that was on Sports Center, <laughs> and not just the person who went against Donald Trump. Definitely. And we do have to talk about uh, the incident that you just mentioned. At the height of your career at ESPN, or your time at ESPN, you found yourself in a firestorm where you sent a tweet um, regarding President Donald Trump, and you even had then Press Secretary Sarah Huckabee Sanders calling for you to be fired. Can you tell me what was going through your mind at that moment? So what wasn't going through my mind uh, was ESPN company policy in terms of social media. There was a policy, just so people know. I just, I, you know, as I say to, to have said to people since, is that if I actually realized what I was tweeting would create the level of firestorm that it did, I probably 
probably would not have tweeted it. Um, just because of uh, the fact of the position my show at the time was in, understanding what the collateral damage was that maybe I might have thought twice. I don't regret it, so people shouldn't um, read it that way. And you also talk about how you can't really separate sports from uh, from politics as well. So did you notice that in that sense after the, the backlash that you received that the two go hand in hand? They always have. And the thing is that we have to be careful about what we put in the political bag and what I consider to be just about human dignity. Racism is not politics to me. Racism is just a simple right or wrong. And that does not deserve to be put in the politics bag because politics means that there's a pro and a con. Is there a pro to racism that, I don't, that I'm unaware of? So what are you exactly arguing against? Very interesting perspective. Um, and you right now are a contributing uh, writer for The Atlantic and you also host the popular podcast Unbothered. What's next? I want to make sure that I create things that will uplift other black women in particular and make a space. Because when I came into this business, looking at the diversity in sports media, it was disappointing and embarrassing. I mean, at one point when I was a sports columnist, I was the only black female sports columnist at a daily newspaper in North America. So I want to create something where black women their voices can be heard. So that's why with Spotify, I've created the Unbothered Network, which is a podcast center for black women, black women led. And we're launching our first two podcasts in the first two weeks of November. So I'm really happy to be able to be in a position to create opportunities for others. What do you hope that the people reading take away from your memoir? Two main things I hope people take away from. One is that your, your circumstances do not dictate the purpose and the life you imagine for yourself. Regardless of what I faced as a child and growing up, is like, that's not an excuse not to succeed. The other thing I hope people take away is why your people are still here, be it a grandmother, auntie, mother, father, whoever it is, ask them about their lives. So I hope people take away from this. Ask your people everything while they're here. That is a word while they're still here. Thank you so much, Jamal, <laughs> for joining us. And Uphill, a memoir, will be available to purchase wherever books are sold beginning tomorrow. And we did reach out to ESPN. They declined to comment. Before we go tonight, the image of the day or images across India. We have seen so many scenes like this of devotees lighting candles and lights as they mark the start of Diwali, the Hindu festival of lights. Incredible photos. And that is our show for this hour. Stay tuned to ABC News Live for more context and analysis of the day's top stories. Thank you for streaming with us. Coming up in the next hour, we're staying on top of a few things. The Supreme Court Justice weighing in on whether Senator Lindsey Graham should have to testify before a Georgia grand jury. The deal made in court as the trial started for two former Minneapolis police officers charged in the killing of George Floyd. America's number one news, ABC News. Most watched, most trusted, and streaming live to you anytime, anywhere, and free. This is ABC News Live, America's number one streaming news, free to you 24-7. Watch America's number one news whenever you want it, wherever you are, anytime. ABC News Live, streaming live and free on all platforms. Ready for election night, I'm ready for debate night, I'm ready for it all. This midterms is really important. Hi everyone. We're gonna run you ragged. What would George do? You're working on it, George. We're going to make you proud. With so much at stake in our world right now, we wanted to thank you for your trust and for making ABC News America's number one news. And thank you for making ABC News Live America's number one streaming news. He thought he was God. He's now one of the most vilified men in the world. He is the everyman. Zelensky is the Tom Hanks of Ukraine. The fact that a little nice Jewish boy is 5'7 is showing up this KGB agent in the Kremlin. What do you say to Americans who see Russia and you not only as a rival, but an unfriendly adversary? Two men at war. Which Vladimir will take over? The world is not going to be the same. 
Amber Rose Isaac was the love of my life. She went into the hospital. And then I just see Shimani as... She was as good as dead as soon as she walked into that hospital. Black women are four times more likely to die than their white counterparts with the same symptoms. I can't let Amber be another statistic. We need to make sure that this doesn't happen to anyone else. This fight is not over. We're doing this together, man. I'm Mona Kosar Abdi in for Lindsay Davis. Thanks for streaming with us. We are monitoring several developments here at ABC News at this hour. Supreme Court Justice Clarence Thomas has briefly shielded Senator Lindsey Graham from having to testify before a Georgia grand jury investigating the 2020 presidential election. A unanimous three-judge appeals court panel, two of them appointed by former President Trump, had previously ruled that Senator Graham should be required to answer some questions, if not all of the grand jury's questions. Justice Thomas gave prosecutors until Thursday to respond. A former Minneapolis police officer charged in connection with killing George Floyd has pleaded guilty to manslaughter. J. Alexander King agreed to a plea deal as jury selection was getting underway. He was kneeling on Floyd's back while Derek Chauvin's knee was on his neck. Former officer To Tao, who rejected a plea deal earlier this year, today waived his rights to a jury trial, allowing a judge to decide his case. And tonight's Powerball jackpot is now at $625 million. It is the eighth largest in the game's history. No one has won the big prize since August. The chances of winning, one in 292 million. Now to yet another deadly shooting inside an American school, this time in St. Louis. Students were sent running from the city's Central Visual and Performing Arts High School amid reports of a shooter. Police have identified the gunman as 19-year-old Orlando Harris. ABC's Alex Perez has more from St. Louis. All too familiar images in this country terrified children running for their lives during another deadly school shooting. There's a report of an active shooter in a high school. The calls for help coming just after 9 a.m. at the Central Visual and Performing Arts High School in St. Louis. <laughs> One student live streaming from inside a classroom. Just as police arrived, okay, everybody lined up in a single file line, okay? And guided them to safety. I seen my friend have all blood on her hand, and it was like she seen the shooter, and they, the shooter came to her and said, you ready to die? Worried parents racing to the school. When we got here, I just started hearing shots, and they just made us get down, and they told us to get away from the scene. So she was communicating with me inside and letting me know that everything is okay. Police say the suspect was armed with a long gun and killed one adult woman and a teenage girl before police killed him on the third floor. Police insist the school doors were locked, but they did not reveal how the suspect got inside. The security staff did an outstanding job identifying the suspect's uh, efforts to enter and immediately notified other staff. Students checking on each other and reuniting with parents at a nearby parking lot. Our children shouldn't have to experience this. The FBI and ATF now assisting with the investigation. Our thanks to Alex Perez. A health warning for parents. There is a triple-demic striking children. COVID, the flu, and RSV are circulating at the same time and sending children to the hospital. Officials in at least 43 states and Washington, D.C. report to ABC News that they are seeing an increase in hospitalizations for pediatric respiratory illness. Doctors say there are safe and effective vaccines for two of the three viruses causing harm right now. Here's ABC's Ariel Reshef. With winter looming, tonight health officials are warning of a triple threat, a so-called triple-demic from flu, COVID, and the virus RSV. As people pull back, no longer wear masks, congregate together, then you get a surge of infections that might have been spread out over a period of time. And respiratory viruses are roaring back with a vengeance, leaving hospitals increasingly strained. 75% of the country's 40,000 pediatric beds are now full. Texas Children's in Houston has more than 40 patients with RSV, at least 10 in the ICU. I would look for breathing fast, breathing hard. If your child is using the extra muscles to help them breathe or they're not eating and drinking well and not making good wet diapers. 
Two-month-old Adrian Balka was struggling to breathe with RSV when his parents rushed him to the ER. He had to be transferred to Texas Children's, where he was put on a ventilator. But tonight, Adrian is making progress. It comes as flu cases are expected to soar, the number of hospitalized flu patients climbing from around 1,300 to more than 1,600 in just a week. Our thanks to Ariel Russia for that report. Now to the war in Ukraine and the threat of dirty bombs. Russia is warning that Ukraine is planning to detonate a dirty bomb, a weapon laced with radioactive material. But Western officials insist that simply isn't true. And tonight we have an exclusive interview with Ukraine's top military commander on whether they're winning and what the end of the war would look like. Here's ABC's chief foreign correspondent, Ian Panel. Tonight, the U.S. and allies rejecting Russia's claim that Ukraine's preparing to use a dirty bomb and blame Moscow for it. The West calling the Kremlin accusation transparently false, backed by no evidence whatsoever. The concern is that Russia's planning a false flag operation, blaming Ukraine while carrying out an attack using a conventional explosive laced with radioactive material as its losses mount on the battlefield. But today, the White House also saying they've seen no signs the Russians are planning to detonate such a device imminently. We are monitoring as best we can. I can also say that, you know, we've just seen uh, no indication of, of preparations uh, at this point. The Kremlin looks increasingly desperate as Ukrainian forces advance, especially towards the strategic city of Kherson. General Alexander Sirsky is the commander of Ukrainian ground forces. How are you? He sat down with us for an exclusive interview. How worried are you? How worried should all of us be about Putin's nuclear threats? I must agree with you that we are and should be worried. And I do believe that such a threat really exists. And we have to take it into account. Sirsky gave Russia its first major defeat, defending the capital at the start of the war, forcing Putin's men to retreat. He's now leading the major counteroffensive here in Kharkiv region, already liberating thousands of square miles of territory. We create the conditions under which we can make the enemy lose confidence, get nervous, start taking losses and abandon their positions. General Sirsky graduated from the oldest Russian military school in the 1980s, studying Soviet battlefield tactics he says Russia's still using today. A rather basic question, but I think an important question, are you winning this war? Of course I think we are winning, because first and foremost, we are winning mentally and we have success on the front line. We understand that this war is about survival of our people and our state, and this is why we have no other option but to win. For now, Putin is losing the land war, but he's responded with mass mobilization at home and mass strikes in Ukraine targeting the country's power plants, leaving civilians in the cold and dark with winter rapidly approaching. General Sersky, how do you end this war? How do you achieve peace? You know how we say here in Ukraine, we long for peace, but after our victory. Those are quite simple words, but have profound meaning. Give me your vision of, of how this physically ends, what that looks like. It's when Ukrainian flags will fly all over our borders, including Crimea. Our thanks to Ian Panel. Back here at home, the rise in anti-Semitic hate and the investigation in Los Angeles after several people hung anti-Semitic signs from a bridge over the freeway, some even going as far as giving the Nazi salute, one sign saying Kanye is right. ABC's chief national correspondent Matt Gutman is in Los Angeles for us tonight. Tonight, those banners over one of LA's busiest freeways drawing nationwide condemnation and concern. The banner reads, Kanye is right about the Jews, unfurled by white supremacists seen given the Nazi salute. The hip-hop artist Kanye West, known as Ye, has given a series of bizarre interviews in recent weeks peddling anti-Semitic conspiracy theories. And he topped those rants with this tweet, saying he was going on Death Con 3 on Jewish people. He literally has leapt to the front of the line as probably the most visible and the most vicious anti-Semite in America today and maybe even in public life in general. It's stunning, it's shocking. And critics are saying it's catching on. The night after those banners, leaflets blaming Jews for COVID appearing around Los Angeles, including Beverly Hills. As a daughter of the survivor of the death camp, 
Auschwitz, I just felt like I literally couldn't breathe. Mm. And our community was in a state of shock. Anti-Semitic incidents reaching an all-time high in 2021. More than 2,700 cases of assault, harassment, and vandalism, up 34% from 2020. Yeh's anti-Semitic rhetoric causing the French fashion house Balenciaga, the talent agency CAA, and J.P. Morgan all to sever connections. And last week, the hip-hop artist seemingly taunting Adidas, which sells his pricey Yeezy line on the Drinks Champs podcast, saying, I could say anti-Semitic things and Adidas can't drop me. And we are 15 days away from the crucial midterm elections. And tonight, in the key battleground state of Florida, Governor Ron DeSantis and his uh, high school uh, former opponent, Governor Charlie Crist, are facing off in their one and only debate. And tonight, Chris challenged DeSantis on whether he'll serve out a full term or if he has his eyes on the White House instead. Ron, you talk about Joe Biden a lot. I understand you think you're going to be running against him. I can see how you might get confused, but you're running for governor. You're running for governor. And I have a question for you. You're running for governor. Why don't you look in the eyes of the people of the state of Florida and say to them, if you're reelected, you will serve a full four year term as governor. Yes or no? Well, listen, I know that Charlie's interested in talking about 2024 and Joe Biden, but I just want to make things very, very clear. The only worn out old donkey I'm looking to put out to pasture is Charlie Chris. And turning now to the race for Senate in Nevada, the only Latina in the Senate, Catherine Cortez Masto, is defending her seat. Her opponent is Republican Adam Lassalt, who led the effort in Nevada to overturn the 2020 election. President Biden has been largely off the campaign trail, but spoke to Democrats behind closed doors today. Here's our Rachel Scott. President Biden today acknowledging Democrats face an uphill battle in the midterms when historically the party in power loses seats in Congress. So far we're running against the tide and we're beating the tide. Nowhere are Democrats facing that tide more than right here in Nevada, where the nation's first Latina senator is fighting for political survival. There's so much at stake, we all know that. Catherine Cortez Masto, now in her first term, battling low name recognition in a state that's seen a large number of voters move in and out. Tourism, the backbone of the economy, ground to a halt during the pandemic. Inflation now above the national average. Gas prices, the fifth highest in the country. Who is right there with Joe Biden every step of the way? Senator Catherine <laughs> Cortez Masto. The Republican candidate, former state attorney general Adam Laxalt, tying Cortez Masto to the president and the economy. Senator, would you campaign with President Biden? He is always welcome in Nevada, but as you can see, my focus is on getting out and talking to Nevada. Cortez Masto repeatedly linking her rival to Donald Trump. Thank you, Mr. President. In 2020, Laxalt helped lead Trump's failed effort to challenge the election results here. They're running around peddling conspiracies and lies about an election that they claim was stolen that wasn't. The Laxalt name is well known in Nevada. His grandfather, Paul, was a senator. But this year, in an extraordinary move, 14 members of his family have endorsed Catherine Cortez Masto. And our thanks to Rachel Scott for that report. Now to the battle for governor in Arizona. No candidate has been more forceful in spreading former President Trump's false claims about the 2020 election than Carrie Lake, the Republican candidate vying for Arizona's governor's mansion. So ABC's chief Washington correspondent, Jonathan Carl, traveled to Arizona to talk to Lake about her campaign, her views on the past election, and whether she'll try to change how voters in Arizona cast their ballots. As governor, would you seek to change the election laws? And specifically, would you look to limit early voting and mail-in voting in Arizona? I don't know exactly how we'll do it, but we will secure our elections, restore faith in our elections, make sure our elections are honest and transparent. I assume everybody wants that, but specifically early voting and mail-in voting, which you've been very critical of, would you seek to limit it? I think, you know, going, going back to when I first started voting yeah. back in the 80s, we yeah. had Election Day. Yeah. Our Constitution says Election Day. It doesn't say Election Season, Election Month. And the longer you drag that out, the more fraught with problems there are. We just saw problems this week with Katie Hobbs, my opponent. She just put out, sent out 6,000 ballots that went the wrong type of ballots to the wrong people. Right, they only had the federal, but, but she, she was the one that 
pointed this out and well, says she's correct. Well, I don't care if she pointed but, it out. But earlier this week, Lake's opponent, Katie Hobbs, who also serves as the current Secretary of State, announced that 6,000 ballots printed with only federal races were incorrectly sent to voters. Corrected ballots are now being mailed out. My question is whether or not you would limit mail-in voting, limit early voting, uh, given that so many people in the state, it's like 90%, uh, vote early in the state or use early ballots. We want to shore up our elections so they are very honest and every voter knows that it's an honest system. Let me just give you a couple facts. Yeah. 2,000 mail-in ballots were accepted by Maricopa County after Election Day in 2020, after Election Day. That was a new one on us, so we took the claim to election officials in Maricopa County who told us it's just not true. In fact, no ballots were accepted after the Election Day 7 p.m. deadline. Some ballots were scanned the next warning, giving them a timestamp after Election Day, but again, those ballots were turned in on election day by the deadline. Lake offered other unsubstantiated and disproven claims. Arizona's 2020 election was the most scrutinized in the state's history, and there is no evidence of widespread fraud. A comprehensive investigation by Maricopa County found, quote, 100 potentially questionable ballots cast out of 2.1 million. Hardly enough to change the results. I certainly hope that we're going to talk more than about elections today because I sat here today to talk about my policies. Well, we've been talking about a whole bunch of other things besides elections, but but since you but brought up... But I find up, it funny since, that... Since you brought up... I didn't ask about 2020. I, I just asked uh, I do find it funny that voters. the media thinks I'm, I'm only talking about elections. I'm talking about a lot of things. But, but, but let's be completely clear. You actually brought it up, not me. I asked you about uh, about the rules and about early voting and if you would change the rules. I, I didn't ask you about 2020. And I want you, to explain to you why mail-in ballots can be fraught with error. Why it is that you have not said, or maybe you'll do it now, you have not said that you will accept the certified results of this election even if you lose. This I, election. I will accept the results of this election if we have a fair, honest, and transparent election. Absolutely 100%. So, so if, if, if if you were to lose and you're ahead, but but if you were to lose and you went out and you had all your appeals, they went through. As long as it's fair, honest, and transparent. It's certified. I mean, who's going to determine that? Are you going to determine that, or, or what, oh, if, if it's a certified? Looks like my opponent might have to determine that. Well, that's she is the secretary. That's she an interesting conundrum, isn't it? You said something last week. You said that there were 740,000 ballots with no chain of custody. Those ballots shouldn't have been counted. Are you really saying you would throw out the ballots of 740? Thousand no, three no, quarters I, of a million Arizonans. I mean, those were seven hundred and forty thousand ballots. ballots violated chain of custody requirements in Maricopa County. In Mar I mean, first of all, it, it, it's it's not true. I mean, the Maricopa County Board of Supervisors put out a ninety-eight page report okay, that went that through these allegations. That is a fact. Check your facts. We took that claim to Maricopa County officials, who refuted Lake and pointed to the statement they issued back in May, saying that the county always had control of the ballots, adding they quote were sealed in envelopes and secured in boxes that bipartisan couriers are prohibited from opening. But just to be clear, the Republicans on the Board of Supervisors, the Republican governor, now the Republican candidate for Senate running along with you, uh, the Republican Attorney General under under Donald Trump, Bill Barr, all said that there that there wasn't, you know, that, that the election was was not stolen. Are we going to sit and litigate this? No, I'm, I, happy I, I, to I'm do just, it, I'm, I'm just but, wondering why but, they would all lie. But you guys I mean. are obsessed. Well, we have a lot of corruption in this system, and they don't want. I think a lot of people who were responsible for that election know that there were rules broken and laws broken. And they don't want to admit fault, okay? Like Bill Barr, and that's fine. We're going to go forward, and we're going to make sure going forward our elections are secure. Our right, thanks to Jonathan Carl. Now to some heartbreaking news. Beloved actor Leslie Jordan died in a car accident today at the age of 67. Jordan appeared in dozens of movies and TV shows and found a new audience with his playful videos lifting spirits during the pandemic. Here's ABC's David Muir. Well, Actor and comedian Leslie Jordan from Chattanooga, Tennessee, known for his southern accent, his charm, his humor. <laughs> his role on Will and Grace, earning him an Emmy. I wish I had a handsome man visiting me at work. Well, well, well. <laughs> Shall we dance? I'd love to. Hop on my feet. <laughs> but it was during the pandemic, Leslie Jordan and his own homemade videos cheering up millions. What are y'all doing? This is awful. 
It's still March. How many days in March? Slogan. Documenting daily life, our challenges, oh. and making us laugh. I guess when this is over, we're going to all have to go to the gymnasium. So it has come to this. Arnon to pass the time. And when he was recently asked how he'd like to be remembered. I want to be remembered just as a, like, like a Dolly Parton. Nobody had a bad word. The fact that I'm fairly talented and this and that, that's okay. But I just want people to know he was good. And he will be missed. Our thanks to David for that report. And still to come, the action basketball star Brittany Griner plans to take tomorrow as she serves a nine-year prison sentence in Russia. And she's making history as the first double amputee actress on the Broadway stage. Katie Sullivan tells us about her personal connection to her character and the challenges she's faced to reach this point in her career. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. Here at the White House. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. We made it. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Bring them on. If only there was a place in the morning to start my day. With a smile, somewhere to help me get in the know. A place as spectacular as, well, me. Hmm, I think we might know a place, right, guys? Bring your friends. Oh, wait, there is. Good morning, America. GMA, 7A, every day. Boom. 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 Good morning, Michael. Good morning, Robin. Good morning, America. How are you? Boom. Now that's how you start your day, people. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Can I hug you? Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 12 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. As of today, in a big way, we have inaugurated ABCNews.com. A lot has changed in our world since Peter made that announcement. But what hasn't changed is the commitment to groundbreaking reporting and innovation at ABCNews.com. And here's to everything ahead. With so much at stake in our world right now, we wanted to thank you for your trust and for making ABC News America's number one news. And thank you for making ABC News Live America's number one streaming news. We are tracking several headlines around the world. A historic new prime minister has been chosen in the UK. 42-year-old former Treasury Chief Rashi Sunak will lead the governing Conservative Party after Liz Truss stepped down after just six weeks in office. Sunak is the first person of color to hold the office and takes control at a moment when the British economy is sliding into a recession. Jailed American basketball star Brittany Griner will formally appeal her drug conviction in, in Russia tomorrow, but her legal team says, quote, they don't expect any miracles. Griner was sentenced in August to nine years in prison after she was taken into custody at a Moscow airport for carrying hashish oil. She will appear via video conference, and the judge could reduce her sentence. The U.S. says Griner has been wrongfully detained and is trying to negotiate a potential prisoner swap. And dramatic rescues in Indonesia after a passenger boat caught fire off the country's southern coast. More than 200 people, including children, were pulled from the water to safety, but more than a dozen people did not survive. The cause of the fire is under investigation. And our next guest has recently made history as the first double amputee actress to hit the Broadway stage. Katie Sullivan playing the role of Ani, a character who loses both her lower legs in the latest production of Cost of Living, a Pulitzer Prize winning play. Katie, thank you so much for joining us in the studio today. Thank you for having me. Definitely. And this is such a historical moment. Can you tell us a little bit about how it feels? I mean, I think it's the dream of any theater kid that grows up, uh, you know, wanting to uh, make it to Broadway. I think it's it's an experience that I'm just trying to stay present and enjoy every minute of um, and and uh, and it's just been such an honor to play this character I've 
I've played Ani on and off for almost six years now. So um, she's like visiting an old friend at this point. <laughs> an incredible feat indeed. And you bring a different perspective uh, to this role. You not only um, are a double amputee yourself, and so that you understand the some of the adversities that this character goes through in real life. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about what this kind of representation, seeing this kind of representation on the Broadway stage means to you? I mean, I think it, it it makes it makes a huge difference for the disabled community at large. I grew up wanting to be an actor, but I had no one to point to and say, oh, I can do this. There's somebody that has done this before. So being someone who's kind of breaking ground and and breaking barriers is um, humbling. It's it's a you know, it's it's a big responsibility to bear. But I'm um, I just hope that it means that we, it will lead to more. You know, there are more performers with disabilities out there that are worthy of being on the Broadway stage as well. Definitely. Can you tell us a little bit about the unexpected challenges that you have faced? I mean, I think when you um, aren't sort of the predictable leading lady of something, when you are not, um, when you don't fit in sort of this perfect little box, it can be challenging. But I do feel like we're at this tipping point um, where People want to see authenticity. They want to see stories told by people who have that sort of lived experience in some ways. And I think having the opportunity to do that at this level um, is going to make a huge impact, which is really exciting. Definitely. It's also exciting that you're making your debut on the Broadway stage. Can you tell us any uh, actresses that you've drawn inspiration from? Oh, my goodness. I mean, there are so many. Obviously, like the the biggies like Meryl Streep and um, Jodie Foster and um, growing up. I just I've always loved actresses um, that have a strength about them um, that carry themselves in a way that is um, confident. And and I've always loved to kind of lean into to Ani's a pretty tough character character so I like to kind of lean into that that sort of feminine strength energy definitely and you are a four-time US champion in the Olympics what inspired you to compete in the Paralympics honestly it was a, a chapter in my life that I wasn't really expecting to ever have um, I was given the opportunity to try running blades at the age of 25 and I had, I'm a kid I was a kid who was born without legs so I'd never run before so it, it really just opened this whole new world to me of um, competition and uh, traveling the world representing the United States um, was not something I ever saw myself doing, but it was an incredible, um, amazing experience. And I'm, you know, I'm honored to have represented the United States. Well, you are incredibly accomplished. <laughs> You're an actress, an athlete. What's next? What else do you want to do? I just think, I mean, at this point, um, you know, people are people are talking to me about writing a book. I'm just like, I'm like I don't know if I'm quite there yet. If I've I've maxed out the the chapters, um, but I, so that's kind of in my mind a little bit. Maybe that, but I just you know I'm an actor at heart. So I think it's just what what do I get to who do I get to play next? Well, definitely, if you do write that book, we will be right here, ready for that story. <laughs> I will Katie, let you know. <laughs> thank you so much for joining us in the studio. Uh, Cost of Living is out on Broadway in New York City until November 6th. And still to come, you don't have to be a master at carving to get a great pumpkin design. A pro shows us how to get the best look for your gourd. After an extraordinary newsmaking year, and now with the historic midterms inching closer, thank you for making ABC's This Week America's number one news and politics show on Sunday mornings. Ready for a little GMA-ish promo? Okay, here we go. GMA 7A every day with Robin, George, and Michael. That's how you start the day. Boom! America's number one news, ABC News. Most watched most trusted and streaming live to you anytime anywhere and free this is abc news live america's number one streaming news free to you 24 7. watch america's number one news whenever you want it wherever you are anytime abc news live streaming live and free on all platforms admit it these days what you need to know seems to change just about every day what is it that you really want to know, need to know? To help you not just get through your day, but to make the most of it. Feel smarter. Feel better. 
feel happier. Well, how about a third hour of Good Morning America? GMA3, what you need to know. Now streaming on ABC News Live. It's all about you. And finally tonight, it is the season of pumpkin carving, and some people are taking the tradition to the next level. ABC's Andrew Dimbert spoke to a pumpkin carving pro about how to get the best design for your gourd. This time of year, you could say John Neal is the pump king, the lifelong artist and current prop maker for Jimmy Kimmel Live, transforming pumpkins into gorgeous works of art, from Baby Yoda to this slightly spookier carving. John's creations, often an athletic feat. Oh, so yeah, I, I think somewhere between 18 to 21 hours is the, is the most. I don't know if I'll ever do that again. It was like an 800 pound pumpkin. All that physical effort called John a jock o' lantern. I developed a set of tools for, for working on giants. And this is one of them. It's the largest, um, it's the largest pumpkin carving tool in the world. And so it, you hold it like this. But you don't need special tools or a lifetime of artistry to shave pumpkins like John does. John suggests using pottery tools. It's a flat ribbon tool. It's, a, it's really big, and I'll use that, and I'll lay it down on the pumpkin pretty flat and then, and then shave it like this to remove, to remove the skin. And you can use like a wide, um, a wide vegetable peeler also. The shaving technique is easy enough for elementary schoolers. I would suggest you start out with a simple, a simple face. Skip the nose, just do a couple of eyes and a smile. Because it takes a long time, you can take a wet towel and carve for a while and then say, okay, I want to quit for the day, put a wet towel over the surface of it. And that keeps it fresh enough so that when you come back, you can continue shaving it. As for picking the perfect pumpkin? I know that it's heavy for its size. And, um, and then I also want one with, with a fairly thick stem. I know that I've got some thickness that I can carve um, in to really make some great details. I don't want the stem to be dry. I want it to, I want it to be green. Happy carving. Those are some pretty cool pumpkins. Our thanks to Andrew for that report. And that is our show for tonight. Stay tuned to ABC News Live for more context and analysis of the day's top stories. I'm Monaco Sarabdi. Thank you for streaming with us. America's number one news.